Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. Your host, Ken Lane, here every week talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. And we are classic. I mean, I've had some really good rainstorms this week. Uh, the gardens are just over the top, almost overgrowing some spots. I've had to trim some things back, it's like my jasmine. It just it's taken over the fountain. I couldn't even get to the water. I mean, the birds couldn't get to the water. The plants are just this beautiful granite um, uh, piece is coming up to the bushes. I'm going, that is enough. You've got to be cut back. And so I've cut a few things back, and I think that's okay to do if you've got a tree that's that branch is growing into uh, the walkway to the front door. Don't let it do that. Don't let it poke people in the eye or brush your hat off your head every time you go by. It is okay to prune up to 10% of the foliage mass of of your plants uh, on any plant, any time of the year you want. I'm just quoting the book. Heavy pruning should be done when they're dormant, when there's less sap flowing, when they're cold, usually at the end of the year. But if you've got, they're just overtaking the those red tip photinias are growing into the side of your house. You've got painters coming, whack it back. If you've got silverberry or eleagnus growing out into the walkways, cut them back. If you've got uh, ivy just starting to come into the house, they need to be cut back. It's okay to do that, and and now is just fine. And this is the time to really keep them in check. I wouldn't do heavy pruning, cutting back on things that maybe are low to the ground. I'm, I'm thinking of a couple things. One, uh, I've, I've had some issues in the past. This is just personal experience where I cut back heavily my uh, red salvias or, or salvia gregii or autumn sage. It goes by several names. Very famous in the mountains of Arizona. It's in full bloom right now. But it can lay down the ground and start to to kind of take over. It's three times the size it was when it started out in spring. It's had a season full of bloom. It's been blooming since April, right, and still in, in bloom. They call it autumn sage because it looks its best in autumn, full bloom through, you know, into, I don't know, end of October, things, uh, in November, somewhere in there, and then it goes dormant. Uh, I cut it back a little too much once, then we got a harsh. We went sub-zero one winter, and uh, and it just killed back that plant, that poor thing. It was a fairly mature plant, and I'd cut it back real hard, and so it didn't have that foliage mass to protect it, and it just didn't winter over as well as I wanted it to. If I left the foliage up, it was great. It just came through like a champ. So right now what you're seeing I'm cutting back some of my plants. Like I had a couple zucchinis die this this week. Uh, I was gone for a week, and and the bugs came in and just finished them off. They were looking a pretty pretty. They were harvesting like crazy, and then they were looking a little peaked, but still the fruits were coming on. And I went, well, you're kind of kind of looking ugly. Maybe I'll deal with you when I get back. Well, the bugs came in and finished them off, and so I, I sprayed one. I might come back. Quite honestly. They're, they're hideous looking. I'm going to pull them out because I want to and replace them with some winter blooming, winter harvested type of vegetables. Right now, September, October, you want to be aggressive uh, with some of those vegetables. If you want the harvest to continue, we're mild enough here in the mountains, at least at the lower elevations. And low, I mean by 6,000 foot and below. You folks up in the White Mountains, Flagstaff, Williams, or the higher elevations, okay, you definitely get more of a winter uh, than the rest of us. But Payson, Prescott, Prescott Valley, Paulden, Kingman, there's this swath going to the middle of the state. We're so mild, we can have, we can harvest from the gardens 12 months out of the year. You just have to rotate your crops. And right now, this is a window of, a window of rotation. And so I'm looking to actively pull out that tomato that hasn't I haven't picked anything for a you know three weeks going and you aren't going to we're running out of time pull that sucker out put something great in there that you can keep harvesting so I'm I'm looking to put my beets the spinach 
The broccoli, cauliflowers are stunning. They're beautiful. Brussels sprouts are tall and gorgeous. Those things like to be planted now. They'll plump up very quickly, and you'll be harvesting through the end of the year. It's, it's amazing. You'll extend that season way past frost, way I mean, into winter. You'll be harvesting those. Uh, I think I have my first crop of pansies coming in. Of course, we've got garden mums. Uh, I'm going to dedicate a whole show next week to just mums. What are you looking for? How do you plant them? How do you design? Why are some garden mums better than some greenhouse-grown mums, and they really don't come back? I'll, 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 that's more detail than I want this show to go into, but mums are showing up. Your kale, uh, the uh, best, what I love about this time of year. This is a planting season. When the monsoons hit through through the end of October, really, for most elevations in Arizona, uh, what I love about this time of, of year is the plants that are coming into the garden centers, they're fuller. They're in full bloom. Uh, whereas in spring, they really haven't, depending on when they came in, they, they'll erupt like uh, peonies. They'll come in in March, February, March. But they're just a bucket full of dirt. And you might see a little eye coming up out of the ground. And yes, it's going to be something great. But it's not as inspiring as an ever-blooming daylily that just comes in in full bloom. It's fully leafed out and glorious. Agastache. We just had, what's that? It's, a, it's an apricot-colored uh, Acapulco orange agastache in cache pots. What I like about agastache is it's sort of like Russian sage. It's that tough. It's really Russian sage is this spiky blue blue shrub up to about hip high. But but Russian sage can get a bit of, they can get rangy. They can get weedy. They can get seedy. Agastache never does that. It has a little bit shorter footprint, so maybe three foot high. Uh, and it blooms a long time. Takes full sun, crazy hot. I mean, abuse it, still comes back for you. Perennial every year, you get some better colors. I mean, Russian sage comes in one color, blue. Uh, here's a new variety out, and it's blue. There's a, here's a new named variety. It's just blue. They only have blue. That's it. But agastache comes in multiple different colors of, of reds and whites and oranges and apricots. And you've got more choices, and they're, they're easier to maintain uh, out in a native rock garden, rock-covered landscape. Agastache does better. And the Acapulco orange, it came in full bloom, full color. Just It's glorious. It can come in or it starts showing up at garden centers at about in the summer, usually after spring, you know, July, it starts showing up. But now it's coming in full and in full bloom. That's the specimens you see. We just had a rosemary crop come in. Now, we, we sell rosemary 12 months out of the year. We always have a one or two varieties at the garden center. But this time of year... Uh, they just, they're at full, they're plumper. They just have all this new growth from summer. They're just so happy. And when you put them in the ground like that, they just root out really fast. Whether it's in a pot or in the ground, they just, those rosemaries and agastache and moms are just, they just fill in so quick. So the crop rotation is faster. They're growing faster right now at the farms when we bring them in. They just are inspiring. They're just so fun. Now, we're not going to have a garden center full of tomato plants. We're coming into the end of the season right now for the summer-blooming, summer-fruiting plants. There are no watermelons available. But all the cool-season crops, so we'll plant cool-season crops starting in March, and then that's what we harvest through Mother's Day, typically at least in this central highlands of Yavapai County area. Uh, you're, you're, maybe your higher elevations is Memorial Day. You'll, you'll plant your summer type of crops whenever that last frost is. Now we're starting to get to the end of those. We've harvested the melons. The zucchinis are looking rough. You've got mildew on things or, or who knows, or white flies on things. As soon as you see something fade, pull it out. And put in your cool season crops, and you'll harvest those things right to the end of the year. That goes for uh, parsleys and rosemaries and lavenders to your your beets and 
uh, your your lettuce and spinach and Brussels sprouts and, and so on. Anyway, a lot in store for you this show. We've got Lisa Waters Lane coming in with your garden questions right after this. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Purple Magic Crepe Myrtle. You'll be wowed by the sheer amount and intensity of the purple blossoms that shadow this impressive bush. Leaves emerge as bold red foliage in spring and then turn bright green just as the purple flowers erupt in summer. It blooms twice, first in summer, then again in autumn. And at $39, you can have more than one in the gardens. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love to garden, they love to shop. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Timeless Beauty Desert Willow Tree. Large, fragrant burgundy and lavender flowers appear in big, bold clusters all summer long. This unique water selection is prized for its extra-long bloom time without the need of seed pods. The flowers are highly attractive to hummingbirds, 100% Arizona native and just $59. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love their native plants to really bloom, they love to shop. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. And we have Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with your garden questions. Just what are your neighbors talking about? We just share that. So hopefully it'll stimulate some conversation, answer some oddball questions. So welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. We've been on the road together, on the road again. <laughs> yeah, da, 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 da. I'm no Willie, am I? So, no. In my head, I am. No. <laughs> Just give me a guitar and a <laughs> handkerchief on my bandana on my head. You'd be sad. Willie does not talk like that. Where did that come from? I don't know. You ever heard him talk? Uh, yeah. He, does he makes work. a great he interview. He has a twang. He's got a fascinating story. Oh, he does. So Definitely. just true artist. Just mm-hmm. He's actually sung here in Prescott before. He's kind of well, tracked through. I've heard rumors of him. I think him. you're making up stories. Well, we want to make Prescott as famous <laughs> as possible. Maybe that'll bring him in. There you go. <laughs> I could put a press release and a, uh, a website together yeah. to prove that happens. In fact, we now have the technology. We can put Willie's face on with a voice that's not his and make him speak to say he'll, he'll be that's here. That's just wrong. Everything just that wrong. is wrong. We yeah. should ask people if they have any willy sightings. <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we were not doing willy sightings. We were doing plant sightings all yes. week in yeah. Southern California, uh, Fallbrook, Oceanside, uh, that area, touring some garden centers. And then there's a lot of growers down there, a lot of our... Surprisingly, yeah. yes. I, I would have thought they'd kind of would want to move out of the area, but they've ones that have been there for yeah. What it takes it takes millions and millions to set up a farm to have the grade go just right to collect the water <laughs> to get the wells to have the pond to repump out to get the grain. It's just once you get that, and it's just a cash crop. So it's you you yeah. know what your time yeah. frames. You just know what the rhythms are. You know what the mm-hmm. seasons are. So some of those farms have been there for decades. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't want to move. It's your home. I you guess raise so. your kids there. I guess so. I mean, okay. you'd, you'd be like us moving from Prescott. You'd think they'd want to move to <laughs> Missouri. I don't wherever. <laughs> no, I think I'll stay. I love visiting, but I'll stay here. So some exciting new farms coming mm-hmm. online. So yeah. there's a consolidation going on. This is especially tree farms. They're they're buying out each other. Yeah. And so now they're creating truck routes where now we can actually go from farm to farm to farm to farm and get product here. It's just I'm so I'm almost giddy about it. Whereas before we had the logistics of fill our own truck up, a full semi, have it go through. It just makes it there makes for a glut and I don't know. I think things are getting better for northern Arizona. It's been kind of this no man's land of of plants Mm -hmm. where now it's getting easier and easier. So we'll we'll see next year if it plays out. But it's fun hanging out with you at the beach. We did go to the beach. We boogie boarded one day. Definitely realized I'm a lot older (laughs) than I used to be. I was thinking I had my... My 20-something hottie laying sunbathing next to me yeah. and my thinny <laughs> sweetheart, and we go 
playing the waves together. That's how mm-hmm. I felt. But oh, you know, it was fun. I enjoyed it, but I, I felt it the next day. Oh well, yeah, I did too. Yeah, yeah. The, the the muscles don't. Yeah, it does. I'm not as young as I used to be. Really, but still just as active and good looking. Hey, thank you. <laughs> you too. <laughs> So maybe we should go to garden questions before this goes south. I agree. <laughs> I agree. So Mel has a neighbor who has some amazingly and beautiful wildflowers in her yard. Four o'clock, uh, galardias, all those kind of things. So her question is, what's the best way and time to collect that seed? And then once you've collected it, when is the best time to sow it? Well, well, you can just let them go. If they're wild flowers... And they're where you're, where you want them to grow. Oh, you just her want neighbor. them thicker. It's her better. neighbor. Oh, it's has her neighbors. Her. Oh, she wants them in. Her got it. Yard. I was thinking she has got it. Yeah, you. Know. Well, you know, we've got those wildflower mixes here at Waters Garden <laughs> Center. You just come on down, which is probably where she got it from. Could be. But you could collect those typically late summer, early fall, mainly through fall, and you'll know when you can collect it because you'll you'll. Take a few seed of flowers. You'll just kind of rub it or tap it, and on a white napkin or your cell phone or something, you'll just see seed popping out every place. Sometimes you'll see them starting to float around. So some some wildflower seeds are very much like feathers almost. They just catch wind, a wisp of wind, and they just start floating. You'll actually see that in a windstorm or monsoon pattern will come through. So you'll kind of know. It may be just a bit early. To collect them yet, they aren't quite mature. So your echinaceas, yes, they've got seed, but they aren't quite mature enough. If you let them ripen up, they'll actually be better seeds, better germination, larger flowers next spring for you. So I'd say wait a little bit. And then the best time to sow them is typically you'll gather those up, you'll keep them dry and cool, and then you'll sow them typically after the new year. So around the holidays, so Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and there from there through February is your kind of best time mm-hmm. to put wildflowers out. Now, with that being said, I mean, I just helped a customer right before the show with some wild grasses. Mm-hmm. He wanted it, that strip out by his his uh, by the road. He's got really long by six feet. Mm-hmm. Everyone's got gravel out there. He goes, I just don't care for that, but I don't want to mow something, so what mm-hmm. can I do? I went, well... Here's a meadow mix, low-growing native grasses, and we've blended some local uh, gr- uh, seed uh, blooming flowers in with that so you get this meadow look. That will germinate now. It may not bloom well for you now, but it will definitely green up, hold the soil, keep the weeds out, and then next spring, watch out. You're going to have a lot of flowers ready to go as it erupts from, from the earth starting into February March sometime, they'll start to actually look green, start to have that wildflower patch going in your own yard. Okay. And you're right. If she doesn't collect enough from her neighbor, we have some amazing mixes and singles and all that kind of stuff. We make our own. We make our own local blends. We blend it here. We put it together. And then we we sell it by the scoop. It's kind of old-fashioned. But that's the only way you can get a truly local the waters mix. This is our favorites. We love reds. Here's our poppies that we love. We have a poppy mix. Mm-hmm. Nothing but California poppies, different colors. Right. So we've made. So anyway. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Barbara in Prescott Valley. She has a hedge of junipers that are probably at least 20 years old. Oh, there we go. Uh, starting to die out in places. Just wants to know, is that kind of natural? Is there maybe an insect or something? And so what should she do about that? So junipers, they'll live for many decades. But 20 years, that's pushing it. And so it starts to get woody on the inside. So the bark gets so thick that it just naturally dies out. All evergreens do this. But a pine tree has this beautiful central leader, so you don't notice the missing needles. You just go, oh, look at the bark. It's a pretty red. Look at sky. It's neat. It's a, it's a whatever. So that's what she's dealing with uh, in a juniper form. And so she needs to probably either enjoy it and clean it up so that it actually grows in a more artistic form. Looks Dr. Seussish sometimes. Uh, Looks yeah. kind of funky. Mm-hmm. Or really what we do if you want to hedge. We dig them up, or we tie them to a bumper with a chain, and we rip them out of the ground, and we start over again, usually about every 15 years. So she's got five extra years longer than most people do. But if you cut it back, it'll just open up the center, and it'll look even 
mangier Worse. than ever. Yeah. There's just no way to truly bring out an old hedgerow like that, especially junipers. Mm-hmm. That is true. All right. Our next question is about berry bushes. So Larry planted, he has berry bushes two, three years old. He's always had pretty good fruit. This year, not a whole lot going on. Wants to know, did I do something wrong? Was it just the weather? What do you think? I think I think it's a nutrient problem. So you, we plant these berries and grapes, and we really enrich the soils, and the plants just grow like crazy. We're really nurturing them at first. We give them lots of food, and then... You know, they're like three years old. We start to forget that they're there. They're growing like crazy. We've had some plenty of fruits, and we forget to go out and fertilize them. And so that's why we made a special fruit tree food just for this issue, just for uh, fruit trees are notorious for this. They'll fruit one year, and then they just don't. It's a nutrient issue or a pH issue. Uh, It's a calcium issue. There's some nutrients that you put in there. But berries especially, they put all this new growth, put all their energy into it, and then they just stop they just they forget to fruit i would say it's not even too late you might even get some fruit yet there's plenty of growing season yet but come in get a bag of the waters fruit and vegetable food put it on there pray for monsoon rain or watered in and my guess is you'll have a better colored plant and you'll be setting the stage for at least next spring's growth i would say the most important feeding for things that fruit or bloom in the spring fall fertilizing and then again in march and use that fruit and berry food fruit and vegetable food and you'll have you'll have berries just like that great questions this week ken and lisa lane and the mountain gardeners we'll be right back you're listening to ken lane aka the mountain gardener ken can be found throughout the week in prescott at waters garden center listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens If life is a bowl of cherries, why not make them the biggest, sweetest cherries ever? Waters Garden Center is super excited to introduce our new organic fruit and vegetable plant food. This fertilizer has the bonus of added calcium that gives fruit trees and veggies an extra boost to produce healthy, abundant crops. Feed your plants now to help them thrive and grow more fruits than ever in just $27 for a 20-pound bag. Safe, natural, organic fruit and vegetable plant food only at Waters Garden Center. The Get Real Men's Expo is dedicated to spiritual guys of all faiths. This year is full of exotic cars, motorcycles, and competitions filled with guys young and old in archery, bull riding, and axe throwing. Ladies, yeah, you heard me right. This is a great father-son event that creates memories and motivates men to reconnect with their community and a God that uniquely loves each one of us. This year's expo is September 21 from 8.30 to 1 at Yavapai College in Prescott. If you're a man, it's free. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. I have noticed a few plants are starting that very leading edge of, of autumn. Uh, so some aspens, if they're stressed at all, maples, uh, service berries, these are local natives that just thrive here locally. You can tell the days are getting shorter, so and they can too. And so the tinges, the outer branches will start to show just a bit of yellow. Now, if it's really yellow right now, that is an indication that you've got nutrient problems. So you need to add some iron. You need to fertilize or feed your plants uh, with some high nitrogen and then high iron type of, of fertilizer. Uh, and that should green them up. Now, if you've got, if you if you don't have robust green on your maples, on your sycamores, on your ash, on your, on your plants that are going to be deciduous, that they are going to lose their leaves eventually in the next four to eight weeks. Uh, if they aren't super green, what will happen is you'll lose the fall color. They'll just either go right to brown or you, what a, a maple that should be red maple, and now all of a sudden it's an orange maple or a yellow maple. It just totally loses its color. Same with burning bush and service berries and, and raywood ash. You really want your plants actively growing and thriving right now so that it enhances the color a month from now. 
So for my own for my own plants, my own yard, I actually took. Here's what I did. Here, here's what I was doing this week. I took a fruit tree food, a fruit and, and berry food. It's high in in calcium and it's high in sulfur. It's high in nitrogen. And it, it's made for getting plants to bloom is what it's designed for, bloom and fruit. But it's really effective at bringing out the fall color of your trees and shrubs and things. Uh, I know it says fruit tree food, but it can also be used on things that don't fruit. And it just brings out that autumn color for things. If you've got any yellowing on your plants at all, or it looks a little off compared to your neighbor's a rose bush compared to your neighbor's whatever it is. It just looks, huh, emaciated. It just, you've been watering like crazy. We've had a few uh, monsoon storms, and it's flushed the nutrients out, and it's left starving. That will greatly affect how vibrant the plants are as they turn color this fall. You really want them to be active, healthy, and growing. If it's truly yellow, I would put the fruit tree food on, and I would add an iron to it, a fast-acting iron. That's usually what it's going to be called, a fast-acting iron. There's different kinds of irons out there. Uh, we've got a liquid one called chelated iron. It's immediate to plants like, like right now. It will green those plants up immediately and bring out the fall color that's going to be happening here in the next, you'll probably see it in two weeks from now to... Obviously, all the way through October, that's when the, the high country is really famous for our fall color. But you want to tee the plants up right now so that they can show off really well here, here in a month. So that's just kind of the insider scoop. A few of my plants were looking, I've been watering like crazy to keep them. It's been hot. So I've been watering a little bit more. And so they ran out of nutrients. And so I front loaded them. With a, I made a, a fruit tree food that's for here, and then I added some iron, and boy, that ought to really get those aspens where they just go, woo, they're going to glow when you get all done. Your, your ash, they, they won't just be red. They'll be more like royal purple uh, ash trees. They'll be glorious. Your, your uh, golden locusts, they're green right now. They're just starting to get that, that new growth that's coming out more yellow, and so they ought to just be bright, I mean, bright yellow. And so those plants that maybe are a little off, I would say another one, uh, your Russian sage or your autumn sage or salvia gregii's, if they aren't in full glorious bloom right now, they need some food. Give them the same food. Give them the same regiment. Uh, uh, roses. Um, I actually make a a better food for roses. Roses love cottonseed meal. So I've, I've got two foods I've designed for the mountains, a fruit tree and, and fruit and berry and, and vegetable food. Of course, it's good for those. But then I have an all-purpose food, which its main ingredient is cottonseed meal. Boy, cottonseed meal and roses just go together. Uh, we just have our county fairs are going on right now. And if you were entering into the roses into the fair, I mean, that's what you front load them with. Uh, about three weeks before you show, give them that cottonseed meal. We call it all-purpose food because I put some iron and sulfur in it and you know, some bird guano and stuff. It's a great recipe for the mountains of Arizona, but it brings that green out and, and brings out more roses. Your roses should be in bloom in the autumn from now through Thanksgiving. They should have color all over them. And if they don't, you need to fertilize them. Use the all-purpose plant food, and they have, they ought to. You've got plenty of time to set more flowers, and it just being full. That they're almost prettier now with less issues than they are in the spring. That's how roses should just pulsate color in your landscape. Okay, we got more in store. Lisa Waters Lane coming in with her garden tips and tricks right after this. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice, right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. High Waters with this week's Plant of the Week and our Black Satin Blackberries. A thornless, milky smooth blackberry that loves the Arizona sun and produces the most deliciously sweet, deep blackberries. Soft pink flowers cover the nimble canes and then yield hordes of the most delicious, juicy blackberries a gardener could hope for. Ready to plant in just $19 and only found at... 
Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love to grow the sweetest berries love to shop. Hi, Waters with the plants of the week and our black lace elderberry. Tense purple foliage is finely cut for a dramatic effect. Creamy pink flowers contrast nicely with the purple leaves. The red berries are edible and make delicious elderberry wine, jams, or just left on the bush to attract birds. A dramatic accent are planted as a trouble-free head-high hedge and just $17. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love their elderberries, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert, Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding, with a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And back in the studio with just her her segment. This is all about my favorite gal, Lisa Waters Lane, just getting her opinions, her thoughts her vision of the garden. So we trans we transition from late summer into fall, kind of colored, kind of plants the mums are in, that kind of stuff. It's good. This is almost a decorating time of year, isn't it? So you're oh, already ripping so. some things out, going, I, I can see it coming. <laughs> I can see mums coming home, pansies. I think pansies are the first crops mm-hmm. coming this week. So right. that's it's you get time to uh, dress up yeah. the yard. I mean, some things are just ugly. We had a couple of pots of petunias that, you know, sometimes petunias late in the summer, they, they, do, they yeah. look worn out. Yeah, they look dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they look, yeah. So, yeah, this is my, my front entryway. People see our house from the road, and I want it to be pretty. So I am pulling out the ugly stuff in anticipation of the pretty fall stuff. If you are ugly in our yard, even for a moment, if you blink ugly, if your flowers fall off the plant ugly, Lisa will come and rip you out of the ground and replace you. But we own a garden center, so... but. But we're also famous on our block. We have nice yards. Mm-hmm. I mean, year-round, we have right. Right. beautiful gardens because we do. We don't let them go bad. We actually anticipate the season coming. Mm-hmm. So we'll put pansies and mums and asters and snapdragons snap in because mm-hmm. they look so good, and they'll, they'll last right. right through winter. Yeah. And if you get them in, they'll have time to root out yeah. before we hit those really cold uh, temperatures. So, uh it's you got to do it. You've, it. It's hard sometimes, especially. I mean, mine were ugly, so it was okay to rip them out. But I know some people are like, "Oh, it looks so pretty." <laughs> we did find that a few years ago that if you plant them earlier, they do better. They get. They don't do better. They fill out more. They're mm-hmm. showier through December, January, February. Right. Most folks uh, will wait until the frost takes them in November. And then, yeah, you've got some season left, but they'll root out some, but they don't get full and plump. Right. They just, you got to plant a little heavier, mm-hmm. which we like. You got to buy more flowers to do that. <laughs> but we found that we're just more aggressive mm-hmm. up front with things that we're looking for holes yeah. to fill in, mainly with our containers, yeah. uh, that so that they have time to fill in. Just they look robust right mm-hmm. through, I mean, January in a snowstorm. They're blooming, looking good, showing off, and people are going, how'd you do that? In the Southern Cal Phoenix folks, they go, you can't plant. It's it's going to be cold. It'll be below 60 degrees. <laughs> We're all going to freeze. They can't believe things will grow through winter. Yeah. And the Midwest folks, oh, no. We're used to eight-foot frost line. We're from Wisconsin. We it, Nothing grows but ice blocks. We're, going, no, we, we're not. We're not we're in Wisconsin. Four season a mild a four season. A mild four season. Yeah. yeah. So lots of options for us, but yeah, yeah, I am doing that. But that's not what we're talking about this week. What are we talking about? I can't wait. <laughs> so I've had a lot of people in lately dealing with javelina. Yeah, it's been a theme, hasn't and it? And it might just be seasonal or maybe the lack of monsoon. I'm not sure. I can never figure out their patterns. Yeah, don't. Uh, <laughs> I think his youngsters are finally going out on their own. They're, they're kind of exploring, so you get more rummaging. Yeah. So. so anyways, I thought we would talk about how to javelina proof. And your yard, essentially things you can do and then plants that you could put in. Um, that'll hopefully keep them out of your hair. But definitely, um, so javelinas, there's a couple of things people, mistakes people make early on that end up drawing them into your yard. One is if you're feeding birds and you have bird seed out oh, or yeah. those quail blocks, <laughs> things like that. Javelina love those. They love seed. They're omnivores. They'll eat 
almost anything. So if you're putting seed out or they smell that seed, and they have a really good sense of smell. Can't see worth a hoot, but they smell really, really well. So I understand liking to feed the birds and attract them, but don't do things like the quail block. Keep your seed picked up. Uh, d- just don't let it sit out there. Put it there. on a deck. Put it out mm-hmm. where they can't get to it. But not on the ground. Ooh, they're going to be after it. So. Definitely. And then some people, bless their hearts, they think they're being nice, and they actually put stuff out for the they javelina. feed the javelina. Those, uh, those neighbors should be slapped by the other <laughs> neighbors. But that's just I think big hearts, but they don't really understand that it's a bad thing. Training them in a bad habit. Yeah. Right, right, right. And then javelinas are, are migratory, so they have certain paths they're going to use if you built your home in their path yeah that's true they don't they're care gonna come through they're still going to come through oh look they built a home for us <laughs> <laughs> so if if you did your yard is right on their pathway and our house was kind of like that cuz they would come up the creek and they would go right through our front right. yard down through the neighborhood and we ended up putting up a about about a foot tall, low voltage electric fence out yeah. there. And that has taken care of it. And before that, we really struggled. It would devastate the front yard. You mm-hmm. couldn't have all this night. You couldn't have a really nice yard. You have basically, you know, junipers. That's it. Right. Well, now we can have whatever we want because we've, we've, we've forced them to go across the street to the other neighbor's yard. They bother them, not us. Right. And it's a halo effect. They don't affect us or our side neighbors Mm -hmm. because we just derailed them. They went over there now. So it's highly effective. It is. We haven't had javelina for years years now. Um, Half the time, I don't think the fence is even working (laughs) until I grab it or the dog touches it. (laughs) Callie, our little puppy, she she wasn't listening. Uh, She was out there early morning. And I'm going, Callie, come on. Callie, come here. She's going, I'm just running around. And then she hit that fence and went, yuck, and then came right to me. Yeah. Immediately. <laughs> I mean, it's not a going to kill you voltage. It's I mean, I've volts. touched it it's myself. Nothing. It's not bad. Um, the other thing to keep your grubs under control, especially if they're digging a lot in yeah, your yard, yeah. check and make sure you don't have grubs or soil insects because they worms. love those worms. Yeah. yeah, which, you know, it's a trade off. You want worms, but Havelina definitely love, reminds me of that. Uh, Lion King, that hog, you know, oh, they yeah. love, <laughs> yeah. they love their worms and veg, you know, those critters. So if you see that, come in. We've got a grub killer. You spray it down, water it in. Mm-hmm. Grubs and uh, the uh, javelina and the skunks are the ones that go after those. They'll yeah. they'll stop coming to your gardens. Right. Are there some plants you can go with? That, yes, um, but I have one more little trick. So because they love that smell of that fresh dirt, they think it's insects. Yeah. And I have absolutely nothing to back this up with scientifically, but I think it works because I've talked to people is when you do fresh plantings out in your yard, get a repellent on it right away. The repels all because that kind of mass, that smell of that freshly dug dirt that is very attractive to them. Yeah, granular repellent that's all organic. Your dogs can walk across mm-hmm. it. They're not bothered, right. but it masks the scent of the earth from the javelinas and other animals. That come right. That's good advice. That's a good yeah. tip. Thank you. So plants, anything in the herb family, uh, rosemary, lavenders, sages, all of those are, are almost always 100% safe. Now, the minute I say that, somebody will say, well, they ate mine. Yeah, I don't basil know the they can eat sometimes. But rosemary's <laughs> right. and lavenders and oregano and thyme, yeah. yeah, never bother. They really don't bother them. They leave them alone. So I definitely. would go even the bigger ones. I would say mm-hmm. your your autumn sages yeah. and your, your Russian mm-hmm. sages, anything with sage and salvia in the name, right. you're good to go. Mm-hmm. And they really, really do leave them alone. It's surprising. Dropped my glasses, sorry. Santalina, which is a nice little gray perennial, puts a little yellow flower, great for borders. Uh, it's one you could put at the front of your perennial borders because they just don't like it. So they're not going to mess with it. Um, snapdragons. So if you're looking for those flowers to put in now, snapdragons and Dusty Miller, they definitely leave those guys alone. And then, am I out of time? Yeah, you got oh, okay. 45 seconds. You're, you, you're giving me that. Wow. I'm just making sure you're watching the time because we'll we're run out of it. We'll go over. <laughs> uh, carnations and dianthus. A good idea. Again, you know, they bloom nicely in into the fall months and early get in the spring, but the javelinas leave them alone. So those are good ones to put in now. 
that they definitely leave alone. Daylilies. Oh, good choice, yeah. Um, doesn't mean that maybe the deer won't eat them. <laughs> Javelina. But the javelina won't. I would give you this warning. If you have javelina and you love pansies and violas and kale, put them, use them, but put them up maybe on a deck or where they're out of reach because they love those. We use those. I plant a society garlic in mm. the pot and then put the pansies around. It's <laughs> yeah. a society garlic, kind of stinky, but it hides the smell <laughs> yeah. uh, from so they can't find them. That's so that true. works really That's well. True. So, But uh, get, keep them out of reach because they will nip, they won't. Take the plant, they'll take the flowers, then you're left wanting more color. Yeah. So anyway, great advice. We do have a javelina resistive list, plant list, free. Just come in and ask for it. We'll give you one. Helps you kind of hone in which plants are best for you. Be right back with Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Hi, waters with the plants of the week and our local chase tree. Fragrant lilac blooms cover this tree that can also be pruned into a tall bush and blooms all summer long. No special skills needed for this bloomer. Easy to grow, heat-loving, low water user, and disease-free. These are really nice bushes for $39. We also have very tall trees in bloom for an impressive $120. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love local blooming trees, they love to shop. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our little Janie Gara. Little Janie is a charmer with flowers that float above this 15-inch plant. The fluorescent pink flowers will wow the hummingbirds with Janie's charm as well. Hummingbirds throughout the neighborhood will visit your plants. They're just so popular and only $14. She thrives in hot, dry gardens and only found at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love their native plants to be beautiful and hassle-free, they love to shop. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. At the bottom of the hour, I'd mentioned just how to make, bring the most color out of your autumn colored plants so yeah you don't want things to go yellow too soon or it's a nutritional problem and you'll you actually won't have a red maple it'll just go yellow or go straight to brown and you'll totally lose the fall color and it's all about nutrients i won't reiterate that but i did mention aspens and let me just share one aspen that i think gets underplayed i I just helped a friend design a new uh, entrance from the from the driveway to the patios right into the front door And we were using sentinel aspens. The reason I chose sentinel over our our populous tremuloides, the one that naturally grows here, the trembling leaf uh, aspens or native northern Arizona aspens, this is an offshoot of that. It's a cousin. But what it does, it stays narrower. It doesn't sucker as much. But but mainly it, it doesn't get the leaf disease. Uh, so many aspens here get get a leaf spot, get some brown tips on the ends, and birds just spread it through from the forest into your into your own yard. And the sentinel is less prone to that, and it just does. It's not as wide, not as aggressive. It gets just as tall, so it's going to go to the moon. It's going to go forty, fifty feet tall, but it's only going to get four or five feet wide. So it has this beautiful columnar shape. Whereas so many of our native aspens sucker more. So you'll have a cluster of them. And they're just always coming up in places. The sentinel aspen, uh, when you look at the leaf, you won't be able to tell the difference. But the form or, or the genetic, how they grow, this one's grown to be a tall, taller version with less width. It's just not as chubby as, as, your, as your native varieties. We've got both varieties. So we've got the multi-stems, single stems, generally sentinel uh, aspens are single trunked, so they're made to. So we just line the driveway, line the walkway, so it's not going to impede or try to grow out of its space, at least in our lifetime. Maybe twenty years from now it might be too aggressive, but right now it's beautiful for the next years to come. That's the kind of plant you want. 
And now it is, it's a great time to be planting those so that you can enjoy the fall color as they start to turn. Aspens are generally one of the first things to turn color, usually by October 1, if not the end of September. Now, the first autumn days, you're starting to see aspens starting to, to, to turn, turn color. There is a European variety, just while we're on that subject, just so you're fully informed or, or you can tell what a nerd I am when it comes to trees. <laughs> There's a Swedish aspen. It grows in the Alps. It grows in, in, in Europe. And it, has a, it does not look like our aspen. It is, it's kind of got the same genetics, but it's got more of a serrated edge. And it does not look the same. If you're truly in northern Arizona and you fell in love with our aspens, probably you don't want to choose a Swedish Swedish aspen is the common name to it. It's also populous, but the Swedish aspen, aspen is what it's called. Oh, say that 10 times fast. But you want our local native aspen. And while we're on it, there's field-grown aspen. Then there's native dug aspen. So if, if a rancher's got a, a, a bunch of aspens out there, he'll have his cowboys go out and just dig them up. Put them into a pot. Try to grow them. They're generally ball and burlapped. There's their field dug. They're full. They're, they're native growing wild out there. They'll dig them up, wrap them in burlap, put them in a pot, take them to the nursery, sell them. I, I, you'll know who they are because they look dinged up and mangled, and the deer have been rubbing their antlers on them, and they just look less even. The ones that are grown in a in a field. They're much more cookie cutter. They look exact. They're perfect. Each branch. So they might have one to four different uh, uh, aspen branches or trees coming up out of this cluster, and they're perfect. They're just they're exact. Every single one of them is the same. I've I've stopped selling or trying to trying to sell the the naturally dug ones from a ranch someplace. Because the loss rate is much greater on them, and they just don't have the form. They just they don't take as well, and they don't look as well. They're generally a little less expensive, but if you're putting a tree in, you really want to put your money in your trees. You want a nice-looking tree. You want it to be perfect. You want it to be straight. You want it to be uniform. And so I find that the field-grown varieties are far better, and the take is virtually 100%. And so that's that's really we've migrated everyone over to a farm raised farm fre- uh, uh, raised trees. Nothing is wild dug out there. That would go also not just for aspen. I've seen the same thing happen with manzanita. Some folks will go out, some cowboys, some someone will go out and take the pups, the side shoots from a manzanita, and they'll pot them up. And they say they've rooted them out. You can never really tell. I mean, I'll actually pop them out of, out, out of the pot and break. I'll take some of the soil off and go, is this rooted or not? And nine times out of ten, they were just potted like a month ago. And they just don't take. They don't transplant. You want a manzanita that was grown from a cutting uh, two, three, four, five years ago. Now it's fully rooted, and now it's been head. It's been the the crown has been pruned back, and now it's starting to get bushy. Those are the varieties. The, I know it's a native, and you see them growing wild out there. But the pups, those side shoots, don't come up very well. So natives, nine out of ten, usually when you're digging them up out of your yard, want to move it someplace, they die nine times out of ten. In a farm setting, we can we can control that more, and the loss is still. Very heavy on manzanita, but at least we can cull out the, that 25% that die off. We go, oh, we're left with this many. We now root prune them and we trim them and we trim so that they get some bulk to them. And now when they come to the garden center, they look better and they transplant virtually 100% of them. Well, manzanita, if you kill that one, it's going to be you overwatered it. That's one I would not put on a drip system. I would plant it out there. I'd give it a water basin. And when you think about it, Water by hand. It's just they're that tough. If you've got nothing but rock in your yard, I would say manzanita is perfect. And you don't have a drip system going out there or out by the mailbox or by the side of the driveway. You want something robust, full sun, evergreen with that classic red bark that you see in the wild. Just You'll see manzanita growing just out there. When you walk the Bradshaws and Mingus and just out and about, you'll see at all elevations in Arizona – 
manzanita. There's several varieties that grow. We've got three or four, I think I've got five varieties here at the garden center, but all of none of them have been harvested from the wild. They've all been groomed at a farm and then then graded. And so you know you're getting a fully rooted plant. And so you'll you'll get some of that sometimes. So kind of just be aware so you're 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 trained on what you're buying and, and how it was harvested and raised. You you should know that. But right now you're in a tree season. The number one thing was, I just want to mention the aspens, Swedish aspen or wild dug. Some rancher just pulled them up out of the ground and shoved them in a pot. And then, then you've got your farm raised. And so they're much more perfect, more, more uniform, and they'll all be fine. And some of these plants, like I've got some sentinel aspens that are, oh, they got to be 15 feet. I mean, they're tall, 15, not 20 feet tall. They're more than most people can handle. Have your garden center plant it for you. Like, there's two ways to deal with your garden centers. So some of my friends, we're all buddies, um, they'll just charge to put a hole in the ground and shove it in the ground. We said, that's not really great for, for the mountains of Arizona. So what we do is we bring the jackhammer, we make a, a hole, but then we also want to amend the soil and, and filter out some of the rocks. And so we're adding some organics. We're taking the rocks out, and we're actually staking the trees. So our price seems to be a little bit more, but it includes a lot more. So you can't just go, how much does it cost to plant a plant? You know, what's included in that as well? Then we've got flatbed trucks and huge dollies and, I mean, just the right professionals to put them in the ground right. So when we put a plant in the ground – uh, in your backyard or whatever, um, they just they don't die. They just don't die, or we'll come out. We're motivated for it not to die. We come out to go, let's just look at this before you have issues. So we'll make service calls and just make sure you're successful. But if it's beyond what you can do, some big spruce trees are showing up at the garden centers. They weigh like 500 pounds or 10 feet tall. You want the garden center to, to plant that for you. It's so affordable. Just... Tell me, you're not going to get that in your Prius. You need a flatbed truck, three men and a boy to get that thing in the back backyard. Anyway, I'll be right back after this. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. If life is a bowl of cherries, why not make them the biggest, sweetest cherries ever? Waters Garden Center is super excited to introduce our new organic fruit and vegetable plant food. This fertilizer has the bonus of added calcium that gives fruit trees and veggies an extra boost to produce healthy, abundant crops. Feed your plants now to help them thrive and grow more fruits than ever in just $27 for a 20-pound bag. Save natural, organic, fruit and vegetable plant food only at Waters Garden Center. The Get Real Men's Expo is dedicated to spiritual guys of all faiths. This year is full of exotic cars, motorcycles, and competitions filled with guys young and old in archery, bull riding, and axe throwing. Ladies, yeah, you heard me right. This is a great father-son event that creates memories and motivates men to reconnect with their community and a God that uniquely loves each one of us. This year's expo is September 21 from 8.30 to 1 at Yavapai College in Prescott. If you're a man, it's free. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. If you have design, I, you know, your brain just goes into a fog going, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, that can be a challenge. You, once you get, a, get a, a yard started, a design going, you, you know what you are. I'm a cottage gardener. I like Southwest. I'm going all native or I want mainly evergreens. Once you know what you have, it's easy to add a few plants and just kind of add to it. I want to make my patio more comfortable. I got a new hot tub coming. I want to privatize that. Or I want my front yard to be more welcoming. Or I want fall color. Um, you, you just know where to start. It's really important to get those trees placed right. And, and if you're new, you've got a new house, if you've got a bare spot out in the yard, just been, it's been bugging you, you are into the planting time for trees, the fall. I mean, September, October, really up until about Thanksgiving is just a sweet spot. You really do well 
at planting now. But if you don't know where to begin, what do you do? You search Google and you become even more confused than ever. I don't even know where to begin. There are so many voices talking to me. Uh, we, we do have nursery professionals that make house calls. If that's of interest, what I do, at least at Waters Garden Center, I, I know a lot of folks make house calls, but at our garden center, I set my employees up with their own side business. And so for a couple hundred bucks, they'll come out and, and they keep most of that money. And then I give them a coupon to give you that pays for their 200 bucks. It's just like, it's like a win, win, win. You actually, you probably make money on the deal, but mainly you get someone that knows plants. They know which plants should go in now. They know the spacing. They know how they're going to mature. These folks, they go through life, going through lands, going through uh, neighborhoods. You go, oh, look at that. That's a weeping atlas cedar. I've never seen one so large. Oh, look at the size of that spruce. That's just mag. How'd they get the color out of that? Oh, it's a fat hill spruce instead of a regular Colorado. They just they know all these botanical names. They just go through life because they're plant nerds. They just love plants and they like connecting people with plants so you've got someone that can help you at least the initial design you, not every you don't want them coming out you know every month but at least get you started when i go out i'll take flags irrigation flags and a sharpie i go here you want about three arizona cypress to block that neighbor off and here's where you want to place them. i'll actually go az cypress bump and i pop it in the ground and so now you know exactly where to put them. Or if our planting team comes out, they go, oh, yeah, there, there they are. They came in a plot three. Here, here, here's where they go. And it just simplifies the whole process. And if that's not of interest, every week we have a free garden class. Uh, and we, we have 50 or more people showing up. This week it was on uh, wildlife, how to, how to garden with javelina and bugs and that kind of stuff. Next week, it's succulents. This is going to be fun. That's all the rage right now. Succulents, agaves, cacti. How do you garden with them? Where do you put them? Next, uh, let's see, the 21st of September, it's the top 10 evergreens for the mountains of Arizona. Then it's how to plant, the 28th. Just There's a technique. Here's the best way for success. You can do it yourself. This is how you do it. If you have us coming out, this is how we do it. This is how we train our staff. Uh, here's the process, and here's the three things you need to make it do right. And then uh, the first week in October, gardening for newcomers. If you're just, you're just new, what are the frost dates? When do I stop and start things? Where do, I, where do I even begin? We go over the basics of soil, pH, frost dates. How, wh when do you plant tomatoes? When do you plant fruit trees? When do you plant... When do you do things? What's the seasonality of things? And you'll just walk away with that with so much information that you just, you'll stop making mistakes. You'll stop going backwards. You're now instantly going forwards in the local mountains. It is different here. We want to make sure you know how to do that. Take a look at all of those classes at watersgardencenter.com. The front page, there's a big button that says classes. They're free. Hi, Ken, with the plants of the week in our plumtastic muley grass. Glittering clouds of vivid purple plumes emerge in late summer and persist through the end of the year. It's a natural and showing off all its glory right now at the garden center. A superb hillside plant, especially when situated so that the plumtastic flowers are backlit by the Arizona sunset, all for just $36. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love plumtastic grass, they love to shop. The Get Real Men's Expo is dedicated to spiritual guys of all faiths. This year is full of exotic cars, motorcycles, and competitions filled with guys young and old in archery, bull riding, and axe throwing. Ladies, yeah, you heard me right. This is a great father-son event that creates memories and motivates men to reconnect with their community and a God that uniquely loves each one of us. This year's speaker is comedian Dennis Swanberg, noted as America's Minister of Encouragement. Dennis is funny really funny and motivational when it comes to living your faith like a man. The Get Real Men's Expo, where drones, tomahawks, and food trucks rain from 8.30 to 11. Then comedian Dennis Swanberg cracks us up as fathers, husbands, and sons at 11. Prescott Tire Pro is a major sponsor of this event. September 21st from 8.30 to 1 at Yavapai College in Prescott. The Get Real Men's Expo. If you're a man, it's free. Hi, Lisa with the finds of the week and our Forester Feathergrass. 
Dramatic bronze flower spikes start blooming in early summer and don't stop until well into next year. The flowers are so light and airy it's often referred to as feather grass. Growing to just hip high, this dainty grass shows off enough to make a designer statement without being invasive. All for under $30. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love really pretty grass, they love to shop. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.